To call for the world central kitchen strike, Mr. President. It felt like it was the right thing to do. And when the president really didn't even mention Gaza or Palestine in his first initial comments to me, uh, I felt that I needed to get out. Once people start to focus in and they see their two choices, it's obvious that Joe will win this election. Hello, I'm Ed O'Keefe, CBS News in Washington. Welcome to America Decides. President Biden and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu will speak tomorrow in the wake of the Israeli airstrike that killed seven aid workers with World Central Kitchen in Gaza. The president is facing fresh criticism for his support for Israel in the aftermath of the deadly attack. A meeting held Tuesday with Arab and Muslim leaders and activists was meant to be private and originally an iftar dinner to break the Ramadan fast. But participants told the White House they didn't feel comfortable having such a meal while Gaza is on the brink of famine. And at least one participant showed up and ended up walking out. Dr. Thayer Ahmad, an emergency physician from Chicago who traveled to Gaza earlier this year, says he delivered a note to the president from an eight-year-old orphan, then left the meeting. We'll hear more from the doctor in a moment, but here's what White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre had to say about all of this earlier today. And so we understand what's how this community is feeling. It is deeply painful moment uh, for many in the Arab and Muslim communities. Uh, the president also expressed his commitment to continue working to secure an immediate ceasefire as part of a deal to free the hostages and significantly <coughs> increase humanitarian aid. CBS News Chief Foreign Affairs Correspondent and Moderator of Face the Nation, Margaret Brennan, spoke with Dr. Ahmad earlier today and has more. Margaret, good to see you. Good to be with you, Ed. And, you know, the, the White House has recently changed their rhetoric to try to express more empathy for the loss uh, of so many civilians in Gaza and admitted they made a mistake not doing so earlier on, a mistake that you see playing out in this public manner with the anger that was displayed with this doctor. Dr. Ahmed is an ER physician in the south side of Chicago. He says he's used to stab wounds. He's used to bullet wounds. He was not at all prepared for what he saw when he went to volunteer in Gaza back in January. He intends to go back. He worked at a hospital there. He said the majority of those he treated were women and children, um, many of whom died from shrapnel, and the children often just from the impact of a blast from a bomb falling and their home exploding. He did walk out from that meeting, and I asked him why he went in the first place. Take a listen. President Biden walks in says very few words, says something to the effect of, we know you guys have been working hard. This is going to be a listening session. We know a little bit about what's taking place. And then he pointed at me and asked me to start. And that's when I just kind of communicated that message about Rafah, about the concerns that I had having been in Khan Yunus and watching the hospital that I was in fall under siege and become defunct, and all of the massive amount of people that migrated to Rafah and were sheltering there now. And that there's no way, there's no alternative. There is no safe way to do this. It would be an absolute massacre if there's an invasion into Rafah. Why walk out of that meeting with the president? Why not make your case and sit in front of him if, as you say, he has not heard from eyewitnesses before? I wasn't sure that I was going to walk out of this meeting unless it felt like it was the right thing to do. And when the president really didn't even mention Gaza or Palestine in his first initial comments to me, uh, I felt that I needed to get out, and I needed to at least express the hurt and the pain that the entire Palestinian-American community is feeling. So, Ed, this was an attempt to try to change policy, but really to get the U.S. to put some uh, pressure on the Israeli military and Israeli government not to go in, as you heard, in a forceful way with a ground assault in Rafah, but to adopt this uh, more direct and targeted approach to take out Hamas in the south. But as you heard there, uh, a lot of frustration. The vice president, who was also in that meeting, has talked to members of the community and held listening sessions uh, remotely sometimes in the past. The president was there for the first time. As you well know, there was a political cost. Aside from the very real death toll right. and pain, the political cost they are seeing at the ballot box. And we talked about that and whether that would matter uh, to the doctor himself. Take a listen. Will you go and will you vote? And will you be able on an issue of conscience for yourself? Will that affect how you, 
how you end up at the ballot box and which lever you pull. Yeah, I mean, Margaret, to be honest with you, it's affecting how I feel about the next couple of days. I mean, I'm very, it's changed everything with respect to our lives. Palestinian Americans will tell you our lives are upside down. We don't even know what we're going to do for the celebration for the end of month of Ramadan. We don't know how, what next week is going to look like. We're all worried about what's happening in Gaza. And because so, you know people? Yeah, we know people, absolutely. And, you know, there has been intense following of this, of what's going on. We know the intimate details of people who are suffering in Gaza. We know their names. We know the family members that have been lost. We know about the kids that haven't been in school for six months. And so for us, it affects everything in our lives, and it's going to affect how we vote. It's going to affect how we feel about the political engagement that in this country. And just to put a fine point on that, Ed, it's not just in this country. Social media has changed how people are experiencing yes. this war, and that is a problem for U.S. allies around Israel as well, who see a rising amount of anti-American sentiment because of the U.S. military support for what is happening. Right, and we heard so much of that despair and hopelessness in the lead-up to the Michigan primary, for example, mm -hmm. in and around Dearborn. We've, we've heard it throughout Seen this it in war. Wisconsin. And in Wisconsin recently, exactly. So to hear the doctor say it again, it's consistent with all the concern that so many Palestinian Americans, Arab Americans, Muslim Americans have. While we have you, there was some news out of Israel today regarding the Netanyahu government. Mm -hmm. Benny Gantz, who's one of the members of that uh, cabinet that's holding the Israeli government together, now suggesting there should be early elections in September. What does that do to the coalition government? Does it mean the end is near for Netanyahu? Well, it's certainly not a vote of confidence in the prime minister's choices from someone who is uh, esteemed within Israel. Benny Gantz is more of a centrist. Netanyahu has put together the most right-wing coalition in Israel's history. He's also his longest-serving prime minister. Yeah. He is a survivor politically. Benny Gantz doing this in public. Chuck Schumer, the Democratic leader, came out saying this is uh, something basically that he also was calling for. This would move elections from 2026 when they're scheduled up to September. There are already large-scale protests against the Netanyahu government. And in fact, there were before October 7th because of some of the policy choices he was making to change his own judicial system. He's under investigation for corruption and because of some of the right-wing policies. But to answer your question, even if Gantz quit tomorrow, it wouldn't collapse the government. It's part of this five-person cabinet put together for the war. Right. It is the coalition in this parliamentary system. If Netanyahu were to lose some of those right-wing members, Ben Gavir, Smotrich, the guys you hear Joe Biden tick off by name and say he doesn't like what they are doing, that might cause a problem. And some of the U.S. officials worry that there is an incentive for the war to be extended in order for uh, the political career of Benjamin Netanyahu to survive. Senator Chris Van Hollen said as much on Face the Nation recently. Yeah, so more to come on that. Uh, in the meantime, regarding the attack on World Central Kitchen Workers, Chef Jose Andres speaking out today to our colleagues at Reuters, uh, now raising doubts that it was an unintentional attack. Let's take a listen to part of what he had to say to Reuters. Humanitarians and civilians should never be paying the consequences of war. This is a basic principle of humanity. At the, at the time, this looks like it's not a war against terrorism anymore. Seems this is a war against humanity itself. You cannot be destroying every building. You cannot be destroying every hospital, every school. You cannot be targeting humanitarian. You cannot be targeting children. You cannot be fighting the basis of what humanity should be standing for. And in an op-ed for the New York Times, uh, Andres wrote, Israel is better than the way this war is being waged. It is better than blocking food and medicine to civilians. It is better than killing aid workers who had coordinated their movements with the Israel Defense Forces. In the remaining moments we have, what does this do to ongoing humanitarian relief work or the attempts to get humanitarian relief into Gaza? It's going to have a chilling effect, period. Uh, the seven lives that were lost here, many of them were European. One of them was American. And this is an organization run by a celebrity. That's why we're talking about it today, Ed. But nearly 200 humanitarian aid workers working for the UN have been killed since October. 97 journalists have been killed, according to Committee to Protect Journalists. We don't know all their names. But what we do know from U.S. officials like David Satterfield, the envoy that President Biden appointed, is that these, this targeting um, of UN convoys and sometimes the police escorting them has been an issue. Mm. Those police work for the government. Since 2007, the government's been Hamas. And so Israel's definition of what can be a legitimate target or not may not match with the United States, 
The bottom line is that distribution is the biggest problem. And right now, having someone inside to distribute it, 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 there's no clear answer on who can do it. That's why these airdrops and these desperate measures are being uh, adopted. The other alternative would be to use the existing infrastructure, and that is the UN. And the United States Congress just defunded it. Right. And it's going to make the attempts to build that temporary barge and, and get relief in starting in May even that more difficult. Right. You get it to results. the shore, who distributes it? Right. Exactly. Great to have your perspective, and thank you for talking to the doctor and bringing it to us. Thanks, Ed. Margaret Brennan. Thank you. And, of course, you can see Margaret on Face the Nation this Sunday right here on CBS News. Lawyers for Texas and the Biden administration squared off during a court hearing about the state's controversial immigration law. We'll hear what each side had to say. You're streaming. America Decides. Federal appeals court heard arguments today about Texas's new immigration law. The measure would allow the state to arrest and jail migrants suspected of entering the U.S. illegally. The Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, based in New Orleans, is set to decide whether the Texas law is constitutional and is blocking the Lone Star State from enforcing the new law ahead of its ruling. Emilio Montoya Galvez, who tracks immigration for CBS News, unlike anyone else at this network, is here with me at the desk. You were monitoring this case today. How did the arguments go? Well, the Biden administration was in federal court today uh, to argue that SB4 is not only unconstitutional, but that it challenges the federal government's longstanding power to set immigration rules, including as to who gets to say in the U.S. and who does not. Texas is arguing that it this is an effort by the state to help the federal government deal with the unprecedented migration crisis along the U.S.-Mexico border. Let's take a listen to what the Solicitor General in Texas said. Now, to be fair, maybe Texas went too far, and that's the question this court's going to have to decide. But that's the context of which we are here. Texas has looked at the Supreme Court precedent uh, and the laws that Congress has enacted and has tried to develop a law that goes up to the edge but no further. As you just heard, Ed, the Texas lawyer said that this law may well yeah. have gone too far. Yeah. And that is certainly what the Biden administration has argued in court. They believe the administration thus that this is an unconstitutional effort by the state to basically commandeer a federal policymaking area, immigration, and that Texas does not have the authority to essentially deport people back to Mexico and also to arrest migrants for what are essentially federal crimes. But again, Texas is saying that it does have that authority, that this is an effort to help the Biden administration. And we should also underscore that the hearing highlighted how much confusion and uncertainty there is about how Texas would even implement this operationally, especially that provision that allows state judges to issue what are de facto deportation orders. Let's take a listen to that exchange. Texas takes the person to the port of entry. Um, you know, as a legal and as a practical matter at the port of entry, uh, the United States is there. Um, so if the person says, uh, you know what, I have a pending asylum claim, well, the United States will not, not going to send you to Mexico at that point. And we've also heard that Mexico might not very well take the person. And Texas here is conceding that it cannot physically right. remove people to a, for, a foreign sovereign country and that it needs the consent of both the federal government and Mexico to do that. And as you know, the Department of Homeland Security and Mexico have both said that they will not cooperate with Texas on this effort. I just think the fact that the Solicitor General says maybe Texas went too far, hope for you guys to decide, That's right. is very different than what Governor Abbott has been suggesting. That in fact, we're going to try to do it better. Like yes. They seem to realize an adverse ruling is coming. While we have you, um, well, first of all, do we have any sense of what the judges make of the arguments today? Well, the two sides face pointed questions. The Justice Department was grilled on its arguments, and Texas was also asked what it hoped to accomplish with this law if it cannot effectively send people back to Mexico. But it is important to underscore that two of these three judges on this panel have already suggested that the Biden administration is likely to prevail on the merits of this case. So they could receive a favorable decision in the coming weeks. But I think ultimately this will be decided by the Supreme Court. And that ruling by the high court will have wide ranging implications on the question of who gets to set immigration policy in this country. And in our remaining time, uh, I know a lot of questions you get, we get on the White House beat is when is the president, is the president still thinking about taking some kind of executive action on immigration 
given the likely uh, uptick in illegal border crossings coming this spring? Well, the simple answer is that, yes, he is still considering these actions, according to people familiar with these internal del deliberations inside the administration. This would involve the president invoking the sweeping presidential power that allows the president to suspend the entry of migrants when it is determined that their entry could be detrimental to U.S. interests. It would allow him to restrict asylum if a number of people crossing the border increases to a certain level. He has not taken that action yet, and I believe that is because a springtime influx in migration has not materialized yet, Ed, but if the, the number of people crossing the border does increase indeed in the future, he could very well do that. May not have a choice, and the politics of it will get That's really right. messy. All right, Camila Montoya Gavez, who tracks immigration for us. Good to see you. Thanks, Thank Ed. you. A new poll finds former President Donald Trump leading President Biden in several key battleground states. We'll break down the numbers with our panel. Stay with us. You're streaming. America decides. So it's not a part of you that's a little worried because no, it seems to be no, off kilter a little no, bit. No, I okay. feel that Joe will be reelected. But when these polls, like the Wall Street Journal one, land in the White House and he's losing in all the battleground states. Then... No, he's not losing in all the battleground all but one. states. He's coming up and he's um, even or doing better. So mm. you know what? Once people start to focus in and they see their two choices, mm. it's obvious that Joe will win this election. Welcome back to America Decides. That was First Lady and Chief Biden campaign strategist Jill Biden on CBS Mornings today. The poll she's referencing, or that Tony DeCoppo was referencing, is one from the Wall Street Journal that has President Biden trailing former President Donald Trump in six out of the seven swing states. As you can see there, Wisconsin is the only one where the president is at least tied, as the polling suggests. Let's bring in our panel, Robert Costa and Jessica Taylor. Robert, of course, CBS News Chief Election and Campaign Correspondent. Jessica is the Senate and Governor's Editor the Cook Political Report. Good to see both of you. These uh, surveys, Bob, just the latest example of how TikTok tight it is. Um, and the Biden campaign has a point. There are some out there that suggest they're ahead ever so slightly in places like Pennsylvania or Wisconsin, depending on which surveys you look at. Uh, but either way, former President Trump still has a big advantage here. He, he does and he doesn't. It's so early, I would argue, as a reporter at this stage in the, the cycle to start saying that someone's way ahead or behind in any of these battleground states. So much of this election, to me, is about motivation of core constituencies within each respective party. If President Biden is able to get labor to come out in Michigan and Wisconsin and Pennsylvania and get uh, women and others who support abortion rights to come out in record numbers in some of these key states, then the polling right now won't likely be reflective of what happens on Election Day. And to that point about motivating the base, we once again, in his appearances in Michigan and Wisconsin yesterday, heard him use the word bloodbath uh, to describe, in this case, crime committed by immigrants, but picking up on something that had been criticized by members of both parties when he used it about two, three weeks ago. Why keep doing that? In 1968, Richard Nixon was famous for running a law and order campaign, casting the country as one full of disorder, that it, they needed Nixon to come in, stabilize the country. Trump's arguing that the country now, and using his own rhetoric, is a, akin to a third world country, a country with total disorder at its own borders. And he's arguing that he alone, using his own rhetoric, as we've heard from the past, he alone can, can fix, fix it. And he is saying that Biden is feeble, not able to lead the country in any commanding way. And for the Biden administration, it's going to be, they have to prepare the campaign, too, for a constant barrage of this kind of political language from Trump, that if the trade policies aren't changed, there will be a, quote, bloodbath right. for the economy. And this is visceral rhetoric because Trump is appealing to people's visceral grievance on politics, culture, and social issues. And it resonates down the ballot, Jessica, doesn't it? It does, because, I mean, the Senate is is also very much in play and is one that is incredibly, a map that is incredibly favorable for Republicans. You know, I think echoing Robert's point, I do think that it's a little, you know, there's time and voters aren't engaged. My boss, Amy Walter, likes to call this the Green Day election. Wait me up when September ends. Let's see what the polls say at the end of September. But, you know, very tight within the margin of error in a lot of these. But, you know, obviously very, you know, if general elections are about the incumbent, as they usually are, it's not a good place for President Biden to be. For the kids who uh, watch us here on the stream, Green Day is a very popular band from the 1990s. <laughs> for our parents, too, who maybe yeah. don't know them. Uh, I hadn't heard that line before, but that works. Uh, part of the reason we had you in today, mm -hmm. Jessica, is because you track Senate contests, mm -hmm. which, of course, are 
just as, if not arguably, sometimes yes. more important than the presidential race because it's going to help determine who really runs mm -hmm. Washington. You guys have made a change in one of the key races uh, for the Senate this year. Yes, we moved uh, Nevada Senate from our lean Democrat column to toss up. So it joins uh, three other states there. That's Montana Senate, John Tester, Ohio Senate, Sherrod Brown, who both represent states that Trump, won, of course, won twice in Montana by double digits. And then Arizona Senate, the open seat there left by retiring independent Senator uh, Kirsten Sinema. Um, and, you know, we have three other races now in the lean Democrat column, Pennsylvania Senate, Michigan Senate, and Wisconsin Senate. You know, all of these overlap so much with the presidential battlegrounds. It's a little hard to differentiate. But in my conversations with both Republicans and Democrats, they there's more of a trepidation about Nevada. Now, I think it's a little bit of a surprise in a way because of those battleground states, Nevada is the only one that Democrats actually won both in 2016 and in 2020, but just by a little over two points. And the 2022 Senate race there was the closest in the country, decided by less than 8,000 votes. And this is also where, Republic, where Republicans ousted the only Democratic governor, Joe Lombardo, there beating. Um, and so you have Jackie Rosen that was elected, ousted Dean Heller in 2018. Yep. One of the unique things about Nevada is that its electorate turns over about a quarter. I, I yeah. love that you included this. The state, mm -hmm. every election cycle, a quarter of voters mm -hmm. in Nevada are new, it's which means incumbents have to go back every six years, four years, right. and literally introduce themselves to a whole new batch of voters. Right. So, you know, we saw Catherine Cortez Masto start off with this sort of, um, you know, ground to make up. And she'd already been elected statewide even before she was elected to the Senate. She'd been a state attorney general. Jackie Rosen's had a really fast rise in politics. She was a, a synagogue president before she was elected to the House for one yeah. term and then to the Senate. So she's not as well known to voters. Um, Republicans do have a primary there, but Rep national Republicans have backed uh, uh, former Army Captain uh, Sam Brown. Purple Heart recipient has a really heroic story, was badly wounded um, when an IED blew up. He had suffered burns over 30 percent of his body. Um, he ran in the primary um, against the then Republican uh, sort of endorsed, nationally endorsed candidate Adam Laxalt. He has sort of a new team around him this time. He has, you know, the Washington establishment, the NRSC and things on his side. Yeah. But I think, you know, he does have to get through that primary. He doesn't have any serious challengers at this moment. We'll see if some of them put up money. And if that turns into a race, he has Lombardo backing him. But this really reflected, I think, more of the state of Nevada, where it has been uniquely affected by the, uh, still the COVID, post-COVID economy, and then also immigration. To me, it's a lot of its makeup and the issues are pretty similar to what's happening in Arizona. Yeah. And, you know, when we look at the Biden numbers, too, this is a state where he's consistently trailed um, Donald Trump, especially in comparison to some of those other swing states. And the one thing, real quick, Bob, to you that, that is happening this time that hasn't happened so much in the past is there's a lot more coordination to some extent between those running for Senate and the Trump campaign, there's a, they're a little more simpatico, at least this time, going into November. A, a decade ago, when Trump started to look at a presidential run in 2016, around this time in 2014, he was a total outsider. Uh, a decade on, he is the party. And so many of these candidates are, if not imitating Trump's political style and his ideology, they're at least having echoes of it inform their campaign. Yeah. Although Sam Brown, as you point out, is slightly... Different Republican in that he's uh, moderated his views or at least has a more moderate approach to things like abortion. So yeah, we'll he to... had a really groundbreaking interview uh, with his, his wife talking about how she had an abortion. But again, d Democrats still feel like they can use this issue against him because he has supported limitations and things in the past. Yeah. I imagine there are Democrats saying to you today, Jessica, what took you so long is always a toss up in the yeah. <laughs> Which is a reason why we all have to go to Nevada for work. Yeah. Family and friends still don't believe that's what we have to go, <laughs> but it is. Robert Costin, Jessica Taylor, great to see both of you. Thank you for being here. And that does it for today. We'll be back with another edition of America Decides tomorrow at 5 p.m. Eastern. Thank you for streaming CBS News.